Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. And also thank you for the invitation to discuss RSV virus infection in children with you this afternoon. Let me share my slides with you. About 90% of children are infected with the RSV virus before they turn two years old. It's therefore a very common problem that we face. And the aim of my presentation this afternoon is to really assist and try and assist in helping us managing these children according to the guidelines. From a conflict of interest point of view, you need to know that I do receive an honorarium for this presentation. I was also previously a member of the AstraZeneca Advisory Board when that board was still active. After setting the scene with a short introduction, I would like to refer a bit more to the clinical picture and the epidemiology of RSV virus infection, and I'm sure you know that very well. Then I want to focus, as I said, on guideline-based management of these children before concluding. The RSV virus is well known to us. It is a single-stranded RNA virus, and, and that genome encodes for a couple of important proteins. First of all, the G protein that assists the virus in attaching to the epithelial lining cells of the airway. And then there's the F protein, the fusion protein. And this protein is interesting and, and very important. It first of all assists the virus in integrating into the airway cell, epithelial air, airway cell. But what it does then is it also allows that cell that's infected to merge or form a syncytium with neighboring um, epithelial cells that are not infected with the virus yet. The virus was first identified in chimpanzees with runny noses in 1956. And it was about a year later that we realized the same virus to be involved in upper airway infections in children, as well as lower respiratory tract infections in children, and later discovered that it also actually happens in adults. The virus has two subtypes, an A subtype and a B subtype. And within each subtype, we've got lineages um, with subtypes. Um, there are different genotypes co-circulating within one season in the community. I already said that it's very common and that most children will be infected with it early in life. But here's the problem. The protective immunity against it is short-lived. So we get frequent reinfection throughout life. So it's not only a child with disease, it's also a disease of adults and especially the elderly. I want to argue that this is most likely one of the most successful viruses in human history. If we compare it to other viruses, then we know that 70 years down the line today, we still don't have any specific treatment against RSV virus. And I just saw that coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, we are now getting antiviral treatments already. The other thing is that 70 years down the line, there's no successful vaccine against RSV virus. Many attempts failed so far. And you know about our achievement with vaccines against um, COVID virus, for example. Professor Robin Green, and this is an introductory paragraph to the South African guideline on the management of RSV virus, really summarizes it very well. In, in this introductory paragraph. He says, this is a condition that is extremely common in South Africa. Um, it is responsible for significant morbidity. And that's true. We, you know that we frequently admit these children to hospital. It's also a reason to parental distress. And that's true. And we'll discuss that a bit during the talk. It's also a costly infection to manage, although it often seems trivial. But children who are infected with the virus are often unnecessarily subjected to investigations. They don't need to undergo those investigations and also subjected to unnecessary treatment strategies that offers no benefit to these children. So this is one of those child with infections that I think no doctor should pluck it up. This is an opportunity because as I said, it's common. And if we know how to manage common problems effectively, then most of our patients will leave us, our offices, um, satisfied. It's often incorrectly diagnosed. And as I said, it's often incorrectly managed. And we'll focus on that. But what about the epidemiology and the clinical picture? 
You all know that the infection comes with a seasonal pattern. We usually have outbreaks that last about three to four months. And in the cooler areas, the inland areas, that usually happens during the winter months. And in tropical areas, coastal rainy areas, it usually happens during the warm rainy season, like December, for example, in Durban. But it may occur throughout the year. One of the reasons is that viral shedding can be very prolonged in immunocompromised patients. In an immune competent patient, viral shedding usually happens for about seven days after the initial infection. And I think this is also a point that we need to understand. The RSV virus is a cytopathic virus. After infecting the airway epithelial cells, it really causes destruction of those cells. And with the destruction of those cells, you've got inflammation, you've got swelling, and these are epithelial lining cells. So you've got increased mucus production in that airway and also impaired mucociliary clearance. So this is an infection that really injures the inner lining of the of the airway and therefore if it infects the the lower airway the bronchioles for example these are tiny small airways it will result in airway obstruction and air trapping and this is why these patients often present with respiratory distress it's not because of bronchoconstriction it's because of 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 injury to the inner lining of the airway that they present with respiratory distress so Everyone will be symptomatic if infected, um, but it's mainly the young children who suffer the most, children under two years of age. And wheeze, for example, is far more common and more severe in children under one year of age. Why would that be? If you're under one year of age, you've got tiny airways. If you're older, if you're an adult, you've got bigger airways. And inflammation and swelling on the inner lining with a tiny airway, there will be more obstruction and airflow limitation than in that of a bigger airway. The disease is usually self-limiting, and I think parents should know that. The clinical disease usually starts off with an upper airway infection. It may go with low-grade fever. Um, we often don't see fever, but maybe fevers that are low-grade. And this is the thing. They all present with a runny nose, blocked nose, and a cough. And the cough is usually the reason to distress in the parents. And um, parents often believe that if a child coughs, then it means lung infection. And that's not really true. Um, we can cough with just an upper airway infection. And about two, three days later, and those are the unlucky ones, where it also involves the bronchioles, the small airways, they will then become tachypneic and with that air trapping. And air trapping will of course result in increased work of breathing, labored breathing, hyperinflation and wheeze. And I think here, once again, it's important that we make sure what the parent means with wheeze. Very often a noisy nose is interpreted as a wheeze. And we must be sure that when we refer to wheeze, we're actually referring to small airway airflow limitation. The children often don't feed well. And, and if they don't feed well, that's a big reason to distress um, in the parents. And we need to address feeding when we ma manage these children. And of course, you know, they may become hypoxemic and hypoxemia is the biggest threat in terms of our management. But I think the core message is that this is a cytopathic virus. It will lead to a pouring nose and a pouring airway. So we've got a wet airway. Coffee is needed in a wet airway to clear a wet airway. We shouldn't try and stop that cough. Hyperinflation is really the key feature that clinicians should look out for when we um, evaluate the patients in our practices. So we must remember to look for loss of cardiac dullness, percuss the chest and see if the cardiac dullness is there or whether it's absent or not. We do not really want to see hyperinflation because that's an indication of severity. Um, we must also look for the upper border of the liver. Is it downward displaced into the sixth intercostal space? Because that's an indication of severity. And then, of course, the Hoover sign. And I think we should always look for the Hoover sign. This is the better picture of the Hoover, Hoover sign. That's the lateral retractions on, on, of, of the diaphragm that pulls on the chest wall, the implantation of the diaphragm. And you can see 
that this is a clear feature of hyperinflation. Hoover's sign spells hyperinflation and small airway trapping. Severe disease is something that we must look for. Um, and there are a couple of warning signs that we are dealing with more severe disease. I've already mentioned feeding and the baby that's unable to feed or play because of shortness of breath. That's a warning sign. The tachypneic baby, we need to count the breathing and we need to count it over a period of one minute. Um, look out for nasal flaring. I've already mentioned the Hoover sign and the chest wall retractions. Um, look out for hypox hypoxia. I'll say something about saturation monitoring. And of course, in the young baby, especially in the neonatal period, um, apnea, they may present with nothing more than just apnea. So a mother who comes in with a young baby in the RSV season and who claims that her child is suffering episodes of apnea, one should take that seriously because it could be a severity indication of RSV virus infection in those babies. What about special investigations? You know, at our ERs, I often think that children get a blood test and a chest X-ray just because they dare to come to the casualty. And this is an important point. The diagnosis of RSV bronchiolitis can be made on the clinical pattern, and that consists of the history, suggestive of the history, the pattern of wheezing and the pattern of hyperinflation and an acute onset with an upper airway infection. And you do not need to do any special investigations for these children. In other words, routine full blood count and CRPs are not indicated just because they came to your rooms. A chest X-ray is also not routinely indicated. It is only indicated if you're wondering about a complication like a pleural effusion or an hemothorax um, in severe cases, if the diagnosis is uncertain really, um, if there's a failure of patients to improve on, on, on treatment and they come back to us, um, or if the condition of the patient deteriorates. So it's no need for routine chest X-ray in these patients. What about sputum MCNS and a very popular test nowadays, the multiplex PCR test? Once again, that should not be routinely done. A multiplex PCR test is extremely expensive and it does not assist with the management of the patient. So it should be reserved for specific indications. And as I said already, the most important thing that we should do when we assess these patients, to make sure that they're not hypoxemic. And therefore, a saturation um, monitoring to confirm the absence of, of, uh, of hypoxemia is, is really actually an important um, uh, investigation that one should perform. And if you do the saturation on, on these patients and the saturations are less than 92% at sea level, that's an indication to do something, active management with oxygen therapy. Um, if it is um, less than 90% inland, one would also um, definitely assist with oxygen therapy in these patients. What about the differential diagnosis? So if it's an acute onset, um, one must of course always worry about the possibility of bronchopneumonia. Um, a foreign body aspiration, that often catches us out, um, especially if there's no upper respiratory tract infection. RSV infection starts with an upper airway infection. And if there's no upper airway infection and a sudden onset of wheezing, one should always worry about the possibility of aspiration. Myocarditis, of course, other infections like pertussis. We often miss pertussis. They just cough and they've got that typical paroxysmal cough. You should always think of that possibility. And then you know that RSV virus infection is also associated with recurrent weeds. So we are often confused when patients come in with repeated episodes of weeds. And we should, of course, then think of the possibility of the inception of asthma, say something about that in a moment. Other conditions, more malicious conditions like cystic fibrosis and primary immune deficiency diseases, um, cardiac disease, HIV, tuberculosis. These are all conditions where patients may present with recurrent episodes of wheeze, and we should always bear that in mind. But it's not all, only the RSV virus that causes um, bronchiolitis. Other viruses are also implicated, and you can see the list there, rhinovirus, parainfluenza virus, human metanuma virus, adenovirus, influenza virus. And those two, influenza virus often comes with very high fevers, um, different to the RSV virus. Adenovirus 
may also come with very high fevers and often conjunctivitis. So those are the keys that you're not really dealing with an RSV virus. We don't often see measles virus nowadays, but they may wheeze, cocker virus, and coronavirus. And remember, we don't only have SARS-CoV-2 circulating, there are four other coronaviruses circulating in our um, pediatric population. Um, and when you do do uh, a, a multiplex PCR, and this wheezing episode is caused by rhinovirus, rhinovirus that causes wheezing is associated with the inception of asthma. So we must remember that it's not only RSV, it's also rhinovirus that's um, associated with the inception of asthma later in life. And then when the patients come to us, there are certain patients who you should be more worried about because they've got risk factors that may indicate a more severe outcome. Young children under the age of six months and especially under three months, eight weeks, six weeks. If you see a baby at six weeks with the RSV virus infection, that baby will most likely end up in hospital. Babies who were born prematurely, they are at risk. Other um, risk factors include congenital heart disease, congenital lung malformations, chronic lung disease, like with the premature babies, for example, um, children with neuromuscular disease, immune deficiencies, whether it's primary or secondary, babies who do not breastfeed um, are at risk of more severe disease. And we now know that babies born by cesarean section are at risk of more, uh, more severe RSV um, infection later on. There are also environmental factors that should alert us, like children attending daycare, children from overcrowded environments, um, children from poorer areas. And of course, those children who are exposed to cigarette smoke or pollution, they are at higher risk of more severe disease. So how do we treat these patients? The first thing that I really want you to remember is that um, we need to be wise here. Um, this is one of the common conditions. And, and if you are wise and you offer the parents what they really want, then you are actually the more successful physician than just a long prescription. Parents want to know what is wrong. You can tell them that. How do we manage that? After this part of the presentation, I hope we will be able to, to tell them how to manage it. They want to know one, what to expect. How long will it last? And this is where we often fail. We often don't tell them what to expect. And then they back because they expected the child to be the better the day after they visited you. They want to know when should they worry and when should they not worry. They don't really want long prescriptions. So we must pay attention to that. So what I want us to remember is that with RSV infection, we often mistreat these patients. We should not become clowns with unnecessary things doing to them. Because if we do unnecessary things, it will not help in any case. And they will just blame you for the money that they've spent without a solution to the problem. So I really want to encourage you to avoid unnecessary procedures and avoid unnecessary treatment in these patients. We need to get the basics right. And this is the first thing. It starts with the nose. Don't forget about the nose. It's easy to, need to reach the nose. It's difficult to reach the lower airway, but it's easy to reach the nose. So we need to give all these patients buffered saline. Mom must clean that nose. It re re removes pathogen, it removes cytokines in that airway, and it opens up the nose. Um, we also need to give topical oxymetacillin. We don't use oral um, syrups to dry up the nose or to reduce nasal secretions, because they can lead to plate atelectasis in the lung, for example. So topical treatment in the nose is really what it's about. If the baby is feverish, offer the baby paracetamol. We don't need anything more than that. But continue, keep the basics right. Um, check the peripheral oxygen saturation. This is the most um, important treatment that you should offer. I've already mentioned it. If these children need oxygen, they need oxygen. And you have to admit them for the right reasons to offer them supplemental oxygen. And we don't need to carry on on oxygen treatment forever. If the saturation settles and, and um, the saturation is normal for more than six hours, we can try to wean and stop the oxygen treatment. And we should not um, refuse oxygen treatment because of just the normal saturation. A child that's laboring and that's tachypneic, his saturation may be normal because of the hard work and the effort that he's putting in into normalizing his saturation. So look at respiratory distress and look at the saturations and then decide 
on the wise use of oxygen in these patients. I said that they don't eat and drink well. Um, we need to encourage the parents to offer them sips and nibbles. That's all they need. Sip, sip fluid, a little bit now, a little bit now, now. Um, we only need to put up an IV eye line if they are dehydrated and if they or if they are really not drinking. Routine medication. This is what your script should look, look like. It's basically a blank script because there's almost no medication that offers any benefit in the management of RSV virus except for oxygen. And, and it's specifically not indicated to offer patients any of the following that I've got here on the list. And I want you to have a look at this list because this is something that we very often do is prescribe these things that are actually of no benefit and offer no value to the patient. First of all, home nebulization. I'll show you why it offers no benefit to offer home nebulization. And whatever you tempt to, to put into that nebulizer, whether it's a bronchodilator, adrenaline, epitropium, nebulized corticosteroids or hypertonic saline, none of that offers benefit to the patient in a home setting. Oral corticosteroids are contraindicated. We're not dealing with eosinophil inflammation yet. We're dealing with neutrophil inflammation and therefore steroids offer no benefit to these patients. Oral mucolytics are really used, I already mentioned saline. Saline is what you should be using as a mucolytic. Monteluca stuff is no benefit. That's been well shown in, in clinical studies. Um, chest physiotherapy offers no benefit. And the routine use of antibiotics also offer no benefit. Why not home nebulization for these patients? The problem is inside the airway. The problem is not bronchoconstriction. You've got mucus plugging, mucus clearance is a big problem. And therefore, if you nebulize anything, there will be a heterogeneous distribution of this and it won't reach the target receptors. And the decreased caliber of the airway, we're dealing with small airways. And if you nebulize these children, you're only delivering medication to the central bigger airway, while this is a small airway disease. And this is a study from Amiroff, specifically in acute RSV bronchiolitis, where they showed that if you nebulize these children, only 1.5% of the medication in your nebulizer will be delivered to the lungs. And only 0.6% will be delivered to the peripheral airways. So nebulizing these children is actually just a form of entertainment, rather expensive entertainment, and it doesn't offer benefit to the patients. What about the use of salbutamol and adrenaline nebulization? Well, we do leave some room for it, but it must be emphasized that this happens in the hospital with an oxygen-driven nebulizer and not um, with a home electronic nebulizer. So we only do it if the patient is hypoxemic despite optimal oxygen therapy. So we've already given nasal prong um, oxygen. We've taken it up to two, three liters a minute and this patient remain hypoxic. And this is when we will do a test dose of either salbutamol adrenaline as an inhalation. And we will continue with it if the respiratory rate improves and if the wheezing improves and the saturation improves in these patients. And if we um, offer them a bronchodilator, it's always preferred to rather use a meter dose inhaler with a spacer instead of a nebulizer, because that offers you better small airway deposition than an nebulizer. What about antibiotics? Well, with RSV virus infection, secondary bacterial infections are actually very unlikely. It's very uncommon in immunocompetent patients. It may be possible in immune compromised patients or in patients who are severely sick who need ICU admission. So there is no place for the routine use of antibiotics and not even a light three-day course of antibiotics because that drives resistance in any case. So this is a Cochrane Library Review, Spurling Review, that showed there's no evidence for the routine use of antibiotics in RSV bronchiolitis. And this is the South African guideline statement that says antibiotics should not be used in uncomplicated bronchiolitis only for severe cases like in the pediatric ICU in those patients who are ventilated. So we shouldn't be offering that. Hospital admission is often necessary, especially in the younger children. And those are the children in need of oxygen, the children with respiratory distress, those where you can't feed them with nibbles, sips, children with apnea, the babies with apnea, they definitely need admission. 
the premature infants and the other children that I mentioned with the risk factors, they should be considered for hospital admission and um, where the family, of course, is unable to provide appropriate care for the children. Unfortunately, some of these babies and children do end up in the ICU. Um, those are the ones who remain hypoxemic despite oxygen therapy in the ward. Those patients with a blood gas analysis indicating respiratory failure, the child is working hard, distressed, and is becoming tired. Patients with complications, and I've already mentioned the apnea in the young baby. So apnea in a young baby, once again, a reason for ICU admission. Parents also always want to know, how can we prevent RSV virus infection? Now, breastfeeding is, is, is the best way of preventing RSV um, infection. So we should always encourage, especially in the RSV season, that mothers exclusively breastfeed their baby. Of course, exposure to other people who are sick, we should guard against that, especially in the high-risk child. And remember, grandma and granddad may only present with a runny nose. They won't be wheezy, and it could be RSV virus infection. So guarded exposure of these babies, and especially the risk babies. I want to say something about Dalivizumab um, in a moment. That is an effective way of preventing it, but it's got specific and, um, indications. We're still struggling with a vaccine. I believe we are close to a vaccine, but at this stage, it's been very disappointing. What is Pelivizumab? Um, Pelivizumab is a humanized RSV-specific monoclonal antibody. And in our next talk, we're going to say something about biologics. This is a biologic. And um, we administer it to certain high-risk babies it, at the time of our season, in other words, between January and May or December in the coastal region, the region in May, we specifically give it to our premature infants who were born before 32 weeks of gestation and who are less than six months old at the time, or our later preterm infant babies, those 33 weeks to, to just before 37 weeks, who are less than three months old at the start of the RSV season. And even children up to two years of age who are at risk, those ones with a congenital um, uh, or cr chronic lung disease of prematurity, or for example, or the immune deficit patients, or patients with hemodynamic significant or, or cyanotic congenital heart disease, they will all qualify for palibrizumab. This is just one study showing that if we administer this monoclonal antibody to these risk patients, that in the case of prematurity, we can reduce hospital admissions by almost 80%. In the case of chronic lung disease, BPD, we can reduce um, admissions by almost 40%. And there are also significant reductions in the hospital days, the days needed on oxygen, the level of oxygen therapy, and the admission to the PICU. So it's a valuable product to use. And we should screen our risk patients and refer them for possible prophylaxis with palibrizumab um, if it is indicated. It is well tolerated and it is safe to use in children. But then I think the most important thing that you should be offering the mother when she leaves your room is to inform her that this is an infection that's caused by a virus, no antibiotics are needed, that it's self-limiting, and that she should expect noisy breathing. She should expect a cough for three, four weeks, sometimes even longer. She should expect mucus, bronchorrhea and rhinorrhea, and that she should um, manage those and not be too panicky because they're happening. That she should seek further help if there is increasing respiratory distress, if the child really doesn't drink, if there's the onset of high fevers, and if there's a wet cough that persists for more than four weeks. So if it's cough alone, if it's mucus alone, she doesn't really need to be too stressed about her baby. But I need to conclude by reminding you that this is a common infection, often trivial, but not always trivial. It's the most common lower respiratory tract infection in young children, and it's the most frequent reason for chest hyperinflation and for acute wheezing in children under especially one to two years. We need to make sure that the child doesn't need oxygen and we need to offer supplemental oxygen. It's the most important form of treatment in these children. We do not need to perform unnecessary special investigations and we should not use unneeded treatments that I've alluded to already. This is a common disease that occurs more commonly 
And I want to remind you that if you know how to manage it well, you will outshine Dr. Google and you will earn trust with the mother. And I think the challenge is on in the sense that we need to follow guideline-based principles and debunk the myths. We need to guard against practices of deviance. We've become used to, to giving these children medications that they really don't need and that are more harmful. Thank you for listening to me. Um, and I also want to thank um, Professor Robin Green, our head of department, and the team that works with me at Pretoria University. Thanks a lot.